and welcome back to LTC Heroes. My name is Peter Murphy Lewis. I'm excited uh, to talk to you today and have a conversation with Marcela Goheen with my co-host Victoria Arama. Marcela, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Marcela, Marcela, you and I met, uh, I believe, because someone on my team, we found your editorial in the New York Times. Uh, you are the founder of Essential Care Visitor. Uh, it's not often that I have someone from a website who's from the advocacy side on the program. Can you explain to me what you do at Essential Care Visitor and, and how you came about founding it? We founded it on May, uh, March 12, 2020 the day we were told that we weren't able to go in to see our loved ones because a virus was coming. Um, my husband uh, lives in a facility um, in Washington Heights, New York City, and I am a daily caregiver where I had been providing care for him for up to that point up to four years every day, five to seven hours a day in collaboration with the staff. So I founded it at 12 p.m. that day when a family member and I were in the family room um, having our sort of daily like check-in with each other as we do as advocates, like what's the floor like, who's here today, what's the, you know, and um, we got the news that we had until midnight that night to, uh, to visit and then we had to leave and we were freaked out. We just looked at each other and we're like, okay, how are we going to take care, in her case, it was her father and it was my husband without visiting them? Like, how is that gonna, how's that gonna go down? So we figured that we had to provide a platform for advocacy for the families that are daily caregivers um, that were no longer going to be able to be in person. So we provided through the website advocacy tools and basically two times a week uh, group meetings to assuage our fear and our terror of what was happening. But it grew into being how to actually advocate for the care given the fact that we were not allowed access. Can you can you give me kind of the synopsis of your editorial for those who haven't uh, read it and then we'll put it in the show notes afterwards. It was very well written and, and just so you know, I'm gonna ask you, you know, what was the premise of it? But then I'm gonna ask you how you became such a good writer and what's your background? Be before you were a caregiver, uh, mm -hmm. you have some professional skills that made you successful at advocating for essential care visitors. Right. So my entire industry was shut down <laughs> um, with COVID. It's uh, it, it, theater, entertainment, um, production, and I've been in that since I was seven years old. Um, and so bookings were being canceled, shows were being canceled that I had, you know, that I was working on through the production company. So I'm like, well, how, what, and, and I was speechless basically about the fact that I couldn't get in to take care of my husband five to seven hours a day. And it was obviously causing a, a, a horrific amount of emotional pain as well, because with the staffing and, and, um, and not people not answering the phones when you'd call, we just didn't know what was going on. So, um, and then in New York, everywhere, March, April, 2020 was a horror. You know, there were a lot of people uh, that we lost and, and, our facility, we were one of the worst hit globally, although we do believe that other facilities were hit just as bad. It's just that our facility happened to get a lot of press around it. So I, I just couldn't work it out. So I, I wrote, I started to write uh, like, well, this is how I'm, you know, this is, this is, this is a tragedy, basically. Um, I also was coming from the place that I, there was an intuitive thought in my mind that I don't think that our government or the federal regulators or the our state regulators, I knew the facility owners knew how integral our family caregivers were to a resident in a long-term care facility. So, because it didn't make sense to me that they would lock us out. Like it makes sense to me that they would lock 700 families coming in at once out <laughs> for the mitigation of the virus and exposure of an unknown virus and nobody knowing what was to come. And I do believe that. I do believe that everybody was doing the best they could and figuring it out as we went along, all of us. But what it was clear to me was that they didn't know that there were daily family caregivers, essential care visitors, going in every day, bridging this care where the CNA couldn't get to or because you might have been written off your therapy after you plateau. 
that we were supplementing as dailies. I call us the dailies. They didn't know. I don't think people knew we existed. So that was the inspiration of, um, of the article. And also how we, the lack of preparedness, like how this whole virus came and then at the bottom of the totem pole is the less than 1% population that live in long-term care facilities that that was that the, they were being disconnected from their family so that that was the premise of it and my husband you know where for the up to four years at that point i was daily caregiving for him and it it's just it was like a, your gut my gut was ripped out so so i was like i have to scream loud so i pitched the new york times and um and the editors at the time and it was the time when everybody was dying and my husband didn't die he got the covid um his COVID resolved. Uh, he got it April 6, 2020. It resolved uh, May 13th. He never went to the hospital. I gave him his last rites uh, through a video chat because I thought I didn't know which way it was going to go. None of us did. And um, he lived. So I pitched the times and said he lived. And they said, what do you got? And I'm like, this is how I feel, you know, so I couldn't. That's what I wrote. Um, and I also wanted to give voice to the many vulnerable residents in long-term care facilities. My husband worked in special ed for almost 30 years. So he's he worked with the same, you know, the board of New York Board of Ed. And I was speaking for him, he's nonverbal. So in my heart, when I was writing that, I'm like, I am speaking for all those residents who I don't know what the heck they just went through. We are not inside, only the staff is, and they need a voice. And we need to communicate to our leaders that regulate these places that to my big point was to shift the blame of who's responsible for the vulnerable is, is unconscionable. You know, my husband is my husband and he's part of the vulnerable population, but he matters. And to not have a plan for that or to not um, prioritize that population for me, um, is unacceptable. So, so I also that that op-ed piece came from my gut, the, you know, and it was a process to edit, of course, which was which was very cool. <laughs> um, and also, every time I like sent a version back, I was like, "This isn't going to be ran." And then one day they they said, "Oh, we're running it on Memorial Day," and I just still I didn't believe that they actually published it, you know. And then when it was published, a lot of my that's a big deal. I'm like, I just. I still don't understand, but I also wanted to give voice to my husband and because in my mind during the whole and still now during the process that we're in, I just can't get my head around how we don't prioritize our vulnerable in a, in a meaningful uh, way where we are serving dignity through the industry. Um, and especially during a time when there's so much change and transformation. So that's what inspired the the article and I also wanted to um, I I also wanted people to know that I love serving my husband like I love being a caregiver like he's not a burden you know disability is not a burden it's a privilege it's an honor it's a joy and I I, I feel very strongly about that and I remember when I started writing the piece I was sitting in front of his long-term care facility in my car looking at the floor that he lived in that I hadn't seen him in three months that he just recovered from COVID and I had I I didn't we didn't have regular video chats at the time so I was just going by what people were telling me on the phone he's fine he's fine and I wrote I wrote most of it just staring at his window outside of of the building with of course complete complex trauma going on and grief and 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 heartache yeah Marcella, the story you just told us is very touching um, and it's really inspirational. Um, I guess what I wanted to know is in terms of challenges or obstacles you face trying to advocate for these uh, seniors, did you, did you face any, any challenges, any people trying to maybe um, not get the article out or trying to change a couple things, maybe the facility or any other party? You know? Not back. What? what? any pushback not at all i mean i never thought they would run it like it because it was it's a personal story but it also it it 
I love our community. We have a great nursing home. You know, um, I wanted the com I wanted the public and the collective conscious to understand that people that live in nursing homes, human beings, they're live, they're real, um, they matter, and um, they have lives going on inside these communities that are quite extraordinary. And, and in my husband's case, he was a teacher for 30 years. He also had three bands. So he's just, it's not this vulnerable entity that is housed in a warehouse. I wanted, I wanted people to hear that these nursing homes that we, what we call nursing homes are places to live, not die. So, so in the article, I was very clear. I, I, I mentioned an aide who will always remain nameless, who still takes care of my husband, um, who one day when I was pre-COVID, were, we worked together as a team. You know, family works together directly with the CNA. It's, it's, it's a collaboration. Pre-COVID, it's been for the past 50 years. Just now through the bill, we're documented, you know. Um, I said, do you love what you do? And he said, that's why we're here. He said, we're here to serve the sick. And that's in the article. And and it's funny because when I was writing it, all these poignant moments that I had, I that I, th I thought would be edited out, that's basically became the gut of the article. You know, um, I wasn't writing a political piece at all. Like that, I do not think care is political. I think in this climate, it became political. Um, I think depending upon what state you lived in, it became political, um, but it was not, the intention of it wasn't a political piece. It was a soul cry, S-O-U-L cry of, of, do you understand that there's lives in these places, there's families that the, are, are in these places, there's family communities in these places, and there's a whole lot of life going on with not a whole lot of support. And that's why right now at this time in the industry, it's profound because we have an extraordinary opportunity to uh, hone in and um, be a part of the change. Marcella, I wanted, I wanted to ask you about, about the caregivers. I speak to a lot of executives and I also speak to a lot of CNAs and they feel frustrated and sometimes run out from such negative press in long-term care, uh, about long-term care in the last three years. It seems like you've had a good experience from the resources that they had, the knowledge that they had, what would you say to the frontline caregivers uh, who feel burnout and are ready to walk away because the majority of the press that's come from the national level has been negative? I walk in every day to our community and every caregiver and nurse I see, I say, thank you for your service. We need you. We love you and thank you for taking care of my husband and taking care of all the residents here. And when you say that to them on the front lines, their eyes light up, you know, these are our heroes. They risk their lives to take care of my husband and save his life. And I say that to them every day. Thank you for saving my husband's life. Thank you. There were casualties. There were bad outcomes. What was that a uh, product of? I think people will be talking about that for years, for decades. And I don't think anybody has the answer, I think, depending on where you sit around the table, where you sit in this experience care world, <laughs> I wanted to use that at some point, is you're going to have a different answer. I've been recently interviewing CEOs of long-term care facilities just to get their take on where we are, not for any other reason, just to hear how they see us as a consumer. And a lot of them have been opening up to me, and it's it was it was a terrible time for everybody so the press is going to pick up what they pick up what we did with the press at essential care visitor is we were trying to educate them we were like this is what long-term feels you know a lot of these young reporters didn't know like what you know you know about long-term care you know they've never had someone in a, a long-term care facility they haven't it hasn't happened in their life yet it hasn't happened in their family story so um, what I say to the caregivers and the CNAs on the front lines today is thank you. 
you know, mm -hmm. and for those that are fleeing the industry because they're exhausted, burnt out, traumatized, and they're not being paid fair wage, uh, whatever the case may be, or they can make more money somewhere else virtually at a, you know, a, a virtual job is we need you, especially if you've been at it for 20 to 25 years, we need you to stay and we need you to transform the trauma to teaching the next generation, you know, or the next two, because you have a lot to share, not only pre-pandemic, but you're calling to show up every day when you had kids at home and you didn't know what you were going to be exposed to and you risked your life to protect my husband's life. That's what I say every day. Thank you. You know, thank you. Marcella, I find that there, certain caretakers, caregivers are drawn to certain types of residents. You've seen a lot of caregivers. Are there any common denominators that you see that make a certain caregiver special and one of the best? Like, what are the attributes that you think, oh, this, you know, if, if I could interview 10 people in a row to take care of my husband when I'm not there, here's two or three things that they have in common. They take their time, <laughs> if they have the time. I mean, in a staffing crisis, who has the, you know, it's, um, I feel like they listen to the family, you know, like listen, you know, families can be considered, I think on the provider side, oh God, it's the family coming. Oh God. Like, you know, oh no, there they come. I know they felt that way about me. Here she comes like blowing through the floor, you know, and, um, and actually it took a long time to use language of care with the caregivers to, to, for me, I, I, uh, the three things they would have to, I, I forget the, the three things that, that ones that our floor is perfect, by the way, we have the greatest floor East coast, like is, um, is, is they, they invest in the person, you know, they know my husband, they listen to the nuances that I've taught them about him, you know, his personality, he's nonverbal, he can't move. Right. But there's a whole life going on inside of him. So he talks through his eyes. He talks through laughter. He responds to different cues, music, um, certain, I gave him a whole list of verbal cues that if you, if you say this, you'll get this response. And, and it's, and, and what was great about the COVID was that, you know, if there was one takeaway is that me not being there, they got to know him. And so all the things I had been instilling in them for the first three years and working with them collaboratively on, they they use those tools and they they go, you're right. He understands. He doesn't miss a beat. Like, he understands. So I would say learning um, learning the person, like learning their life before, being interested in that, um, taking your time, and. Um, and um, also having a sense of humor, you know, about it all. You know, we, it, it's a weird thing for me to say. I didn't think I would say that, but. It's the first time I've heard that answer, but I like it because right. I was a social worker and I'm also a CNA. And a lot of times our sense of humor uh, isn't something we feel comfortable talking about with the open public, but you, you know, you spend 10 hours a day sometimes next to a CNA, you know, there's a sense of humor inside there. Yeah, I mean, they, our CNAs are, and I've, I've watched a couple of your other podcasts, you know, they are the heartbeat of any, if I opened up a nursing home tomorrow, like, you know, they're the heartbeat, you know, and, and that's what I've never really understood is they're the heartbeat. They're the ones delivering the product of care and we need to give them everything they need, you know, everything and, um, and whatever that looks like. So, the sense of humor, you know, is the other day was yesterday. I was there, and you know, my husband vocalized it since I've gotten back in and, and integrated him back to some kind of a baseline. You know, um, he, uh, you know, he's responding. He's saying words here and there. And so yesterday, I said something like, "I think I said, uh, did you miss me? Because I didn't go for one day." And he goes, "Yeah." And and the CNN was like, whoa, like, you know, and um, and then we laughed, and and then you know, we make jokes about. You know, not you know, humor can also be you know mean. We don't want mean humor. We don't making fun of you know disabled population. But the sense of love and joy of the service that we're giving, where it is a home, you know, nursing home, it is a family. You know, you develop intimate relationships with these CNAs. 
you know, they do intimate things, uh, private, hygienic, not, you know, intimate things with your, with your loved one. You know, I think about that, like, you know, they're bathing him, you know, they're brushing his teeth. So, <clears throat> you know, I always say to people when I advocate, you know, you know, my husband, I, I, I said this in our New York State Senate hearings, you know, all these residents in nursing homes, they're you, they're you and they are I, you know, they say a certain percentage of people will end up in a long-term care facility at one point in their life. I say 100% of us will be at one point in our life. You know, whether you're recovering from a hip replacement, whether you're going to age out there, you know, whether, you know, something catastrophic happens in my husband case, you know, this was an unknown disease. It's still, we don't know, they don't know what it is. We didn't know this was going to happen. Had no idea this was not on our bucket list. You know, we were in Maine half the year and then New York. Yeah. Now, you know, he's in a long-term care facility, you know, in upper Manhattan. And this has been our life for the past nearly six years. So you don't know. And, and so what do you want it to be like? You know, um, you want it to be home. Yeah, Marcella, it's interesting that you say that because in your, I remember in your article, you mentioned that point when you came to the realization of, oh, I might not be the best suited person to take care of my husband now. So, um, and then you placed him on a nursing home. My question here is for anybody going through the same thing as you did back then, when is there a right time or how do you come to that realization of like, okay, now it's time for me to get some help? So for, for me um, and our story, and I use it as a model, is that, you know, there's a certain level of denial that happens when someone gets sick, at least in my husband's, it's he's a neurodegenerative process. So. Um, it's a process and I think it's very individual and I think if you ask me when he first started showing symptoms of this rare neuro discourse in my mind I was he's always going to be at home I'm never going to institutionalize him you know the word institution was very scary and 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 very no that's never going to happen to my husband never 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 going to do it at home so then I went through that and then I went through the phase where I needed help at home and so I found the caregivers um, through a myriad of sources. We ended up with two different, three different ladies from church, actually. We went through the agencies, but then we found some retired women who fit better with his personality. And then I had my sister one day said to me, you need to surrender. Because what was happening was the caregiver stress was profound where I didn't sleep at night you know I had one eye open I took the night shift you know and it was time and so in the article I point to a day where I actually fell down our stairs down you know and on our walk up and um and I was bleeding on my elbow and my husband was just staring at me and I was like okay if this was bigger than the bleeding elbow you know there's no one that can help me so I need to surrender so it was a series of um incidents that happened where I realized that I had to consider that I needed, he needed full care or custodial care. And then it's, it's segued over the past, you know, he's, he's declined, you know, it, it's a degenerative process. So, um, th that moment was big for me because I remember just being, I was so caregiver stressed out. I was, you know, cause when you're a caregiver, you're this, you're that, you're, you know, you have like five, it's stressful. And, um, I remember that moment vividly and then it became another process then to um, find, you know, the right home for him. And I was told, and I passed this on, it'll probably take three different communities to find the right place. And that's happened for us. It took us three different facilities to find the right home for him. And um, one of them, though, we when we were in the diagnostic process, we were at Harvard Mass General Hospital, woohoo, the best. And, um, the, you know, they were able to find you know Isabella you know was the place he landed at and it is the right place for him you know it's a uh, Spanish uh, a lot of the eight span or speak Spanish his first language is Spanish I didn't even think of that like you know as the brain degenerates you know, they speak to him in Spanish so it's perfect I was thinking of the place that would have you know the private room and the private nurses and like you know and I would have my own weight you know and 
what I think happens naturally if you get the right care team and you you go to those you know partner agencies partner um, advocacy organizations and they have a lot of referrals there and and for us it was one particular place in in, in Manhattan that you know found us um, and helped us with getting him where he is today and uh, yeah Marcella I, you said that you have interviewed some CEOs in long-term care in the last in the last couple of months of last year. One of the things that I have heard over and over from my interviews when we're not recording is they talk about how a devastating effect the isolation had on our residents. And a second thing is uh, some will be a little bit more honest about being pessimistic about the future of long-term care and the system being broken. Are there any insights? One, have you heard those two? And do you have any others that you hear from them when they're, when they're being honest with you? When they're being honest with you. Everyone wants to dance around the, you know, the trauma that happened. And that's a big part of my message that I, 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 I try to get in there if people can get their head around it is, um, you know, everybody's still traumatized. I, I believe when they're honest, I just think the message this is the same, is that the the regulations that have existed for the past 60, 70 years aren't congruent to what's happening now. And we need to marry the two and do a major overhaul. And, um, and I think wherever you sit at the table, whether you're a consumer or a resident or a provider or a state, a state agency regulator or even a politician, you know, there needs to be complete transparency of the nuances that, that occurred and that how we can get it to be better. And I think the focus has to be the resident, you know, um, I'm going to say that from uh, the consumer side. Um, and I think that the focus, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't cost a penny to care is what I say, you know, it doesn't cost, it co doesn't cost a penny. It's a choice. It's a consciousness, you know, it's a societal dilemma. Um, when I was growing up, um, my mom ran nursing homes, and I know you didn't ask that question yet, but it was I, my next question. Oh, really? Uh, look, look at this, look at this. I have this teed up. Uh, what mentors in your life prepared you to be an advocate in long-term care? So you're ready. You were. You. You. It looks like you read my notes. No, I mean, um, I could be psychic. I've been told. Um, is um, mom, M O M, ahead of her time. She's 92. She's my hero. She's my hero. Um, I grew up in a huge family and my mom worked all sides of the in a long-term care industry. She ran nursing homes. She was a state inspector. Then she worked for corporate and traveled all over the country. Like, you know, when, when the, the private equity would come and scoop up nursing homes, she would go and see which ones they should scoop up. She was all over it ahead of her time. She had a company called Long-Term Care Consulting. And so I never saw her, but the nursing homes in town, when I wanted to see her, I would have to go to the nursing home. So I was a little 10 year old, 11 year old following mom to the nursing home and she was having me adopt people in the nursing home as my grandparents. And she said to me, you see all these people? She said, some of them have families, some of them don't, but it's our responsibility to take care of them. And so, from the get-go, I wasn't afraid of a facility or walking into a community of care where there were the disabled or the elderly or, and by the way, not everybody's senior in there, you know. Um, uh, so I was exposed to it quite early. And she, I think that was just in my DNA. So when my husband had to go through this process, you know, I call her every day. You know, I call her still. She's 92. And um Mom, and then I'll never forget, I don't know if this is going to be a fun story for you, but Mrs. Green was our neighbor who lived five houses to our right, whose family lived in California, and my mom also was, <laughs> shout out to me. she would, um, you know, she was always called upon by everybody or everywhere in our hometown when it came to elderly care, they'd call my mom, and so the family tasked my mom with keeping an eye on Mrs. Green. And Mrs. Green was the mean lady, get off our grass, blah, blah, blah. So my mom, when I was 11, said to me, you have to go bathe Mrs. Green. You have to go and bathe. I go, bathe? She's like, she needs a bath. And <laughs> so I gave Mrs. Green a bath when I was 11 years old, and she was, I think, 90. <laughs> 
So I figured it out, you know, and, um, and so I think it was given to me very early on and I understood it. So I think that's the gap that we have to close now is we've got to get into the elementary schools, the schools, and we got to go and we got to say and teach and educate, advocate and collaborate and groom them, you know, that, um, you know, you're going to get old. This is what this is what it is and and dispel the ageism you know if that's what we want to call it um so my mom and she's aging in place at home by the way Priscilla, <laughs> uh, my last question for you as we wrap up here is what have you learned about yourself uh going through covid being a family member being a caregiver uh being the spouse of someone who is a full-time resident in the nursing home what have you learned about yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, the way you communicate, how you handle stress, how you understand, how you handle uncertainty? I've learned I'm a fighter. Like, and I, I, I've learned that, you know, I've, COVID was, is, and still is, it's traumatic. There's a lot we haven't been, I'm going to cry. We haven't been able to process because time hasn't passed, right? So, time is the most precious asset we have. So I've learned that um, you gotta, you never have to be afraid to ask for what you need and there's power in asking for what you need. And, and as, as I've learned that I am resilient and that I have no fear, you know, I, when it comes to that, because when it comes to fighting for those who cannot take care of themselves, which is why this industry even exists, you know, which is why the multi-billion dollar industry exists is because we are trying to serve those who can't take care of themselves, whether whatever the story is, whether they're senior or suddenly disabled or, you know, in a uh, suddenly paralyzed. Um, in my husband's case, it's a rare discourse that nobody seems to know what it is. Um, that, that, I have to have the courage and no fear to speak for that person. I'm not speaking for Marcella. I'm speaking for him, you know, and he can't talk. So I believe that I'm not afraid, you know, um, and that there can be collaboration and that you can, you can collaborate. You know, and it doesn't have to be liability. So I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned that I can change. You know, there's some advocacy styles I had that, you know, weren't helpful to the CNAs. <laughs> you know, that panicked family member, you know. I'd love to do trainings on that because I grew from being very frightened, you know, family member to, to learning how to bridge the gap of the language where we could have a common ground, you know in terms of approaching the care in a long-term care facility amidst all these regulations, you know, that they're, that they're being, you know, for, you know, they, they're being regulated to uphold. So, um, I, I'd, if, I'd, I'd yeah. like to have one more question for you. Yeah. If, uh, I've met your husband about a month ago or so ago when you and I were on a zoom call and you introduced me to him, if he could, uh, speak today or stand up today and do whatever he wanted, what's the first thing he would do uh, to show his gratitude for the frontline caregivers that have taken care of him the last six years? He would, he's a musician, so he would probably write him a song and sing it to them, you know? <laughs> and um, You're going to make me tear up, Marcella. This yeah, no, he's, he's a, uh, we take his music that he's written and we blared, we blared it through the floor the last week and all the residents were like, who's that? I'm like, that's Bob, that's his voice. So um, he'd write his song and he'd say, thank you. You know, he's a very humble guy and always was. And in his condition, um, it, it's, it's profoundly sad to see someone, you know, lose their motor ability. But what's also profound about him is that he's completely present and he's not um, in any pain and he's in deep acceptance of this is how, you know, this is what it is for him. So he, 
he has so much gratitude. He loves, in fact, he loves his aides so much that <laughs> yesterday I was a little like, oh, I walked in and I'm like, hey, and he just looked at me like, do you mind? You're interrupting care. You know what I mean? Like, so it can go both ways, you know? And I, and I think that's one thing I'll say to to give any caregiver hope is that it, take it one day at a time. You know, every day is different, you know, and, and, but the one thing that is true is that we are all uh, on this journey together and we all have the same goal, which is to serve um, the consumer, the resident, my husbands of the world, you know, um, the dignity of, of, of their journey, you know, and I think hospice and palliative care, that part of the industry, they've got that down pat. I think the entry into a place, the, the adapting, you know, the middle ground where you're going to live for five or 10 years, like, or whatever it is, is, is we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but the hope is, I think people are, are coming to, and I hope, my hope is that the providers and, and companies like yourself, um, whatever you're contributing to the industry will allow the family a seat at the table. You know, whether we have the PhD behind our name or the MS or not, and most of us don't, but we'll, I'll tell you that there's a strong advocacy um, powerhouses out here that have the answer because we just survived the most extreme cir circumstance of advocacy and understanding and seeing the glitches in the system pre-COVID, but also, you know, during COVID having to adapt. And in, in our case, at our facility, you know, our family council, um, which I chair, uh, not to brag, but I, I, we found a lot of solutions for our own facility in order to collaborate with the family. So I think my husband would say thank you. And I think he, um, I think he never wanted to be a burden. And I always promised him like, you'll never be my burden. You'll be my joy and my privilege. And um, yeah, so that's where we are. Marcella, uh, uh, thank you for sharing those final words. You know what you talked about, uh, take a day at a time. It rings true to me. I interviewed a gentleman at Leading Age Georgia about two or three weeks ago. And I said, you know, now is the opportune time to be extremely pessimistic about this system being broken. He says, I don't see it that way. He said, uh, it's a day at a time and there's 25 people that I can have an impact on their lives. I don't have to worry about the US government. I don't have to worry about the entire society. I can change one person's life today and I have 25 people to look after. Marcella, uh, it's a pleasure having you on here. I'm so happy that we were able to talk about what you're doing at EssentialCareVisitor.com. Uh, go visit it. There's there's a number of people that are like you that are in the front line and they're family members and they don't have a space to speak. And uh, thank you for joining LTC Heroes and look forward to communicating and connecting with you in the future. All right. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. Want to connect with leaders in long-term care? Go to www.ltcheroes.com to join our community on Facebook and LinkedIn. Get exclusive access to marketing tips, SOPs, and insights from prominent voices in the industry. Only at ltcheroes.com.